The Wrath of Khan, by William King. Short story and let the galaxy burn. Blood for the blood god bellowed Cairn the Betrayer, charging forward through the hail of Bolter fire, towards the temple of superlative indulgence. The Bolter shells ricocheting off his breastplate did not even slow him down. The Chaos Space Marine smiled to himself. The ancient ceramite of his armor had protected him for over 10,000 years. He felt certain it would not let him down today. All around him warriors fell, clutching their wounds, crying in pain and fear. More souls offered up on the altar of battle to the Supreme Lord of Carnage, Cairn thought and grinned maniacally. Surely the Blood God would be pleased today. Ahead of him, Cairn saw one of his fellow berserkers fall, his body riddled with shells, his armor cracked and melted by plasma fire. The berserker howled with rage and frustration, knowing that he was not going to be in at the kill, that he would give Korn no more offerings on this or any other day. In frustration, the dying warrior set his chainsword onto maximum power and took off his own head with one swift stroke. His blood rose in a red fountain to slake Korn's thirst. As he passed, Ken kicked the fallen warrior's head, sending it flying over the defender's parapet. At least this way his fallen comrade would witness Ken slaughter the slanish worshippers in the few delicious moments before he died. Under the circumstances, it was the least reward Ken could grant such a devout warrior. The betrayer leapt over a pile of corpses, snapping off a shot with his plasma pistol. One of the Slanish cultists fell, clutching the ruins of his melted face. Goro child, Ken's demonic axe, howled in his hands. Kern brandished it above his head and bellowed his challenge to the sick, yellow sky of the demon world. Skulls for the skull throne Ken howled. On every side, frothing berserkers echoed his cry. More shells whined all around him. He ignored them the way he would ignore the buzz of annoying insects. More of his fellows fell but Ken stood untouched, secure in the blessing of the blood god, knowing that it would not be his turn today. All was going according to plan. A tide of Korn's warriors flowed across the bomb cratered plains towards the towering redoubt of the Slanish worshippers. Support fire from the Chaos Titan artillery had reduced most of the walls around the ancient temple complex to just so much rubble. The disgusting murals painted in fluorescent colors had been reduced to atoms. The obscene minarets that crowned the towers had been blasted into well-deserved oblivion. Lewd statues lay like colossal, limbless corpses, gazing at the sky with blank marble eyes. Even as Ken watched, missiles blazed down from the sky and smashed another section of the defensive wall to blood-covered fragments. Huge clouds of dust billowed. The ground shook. The explosions rumbled like distant thunder. Sick joy bubbled through Ken's veins at the prospect of imminent violence. This was what he lived for, these moments of action where he could once again prove his superiority to all other warriors in the service of his exalted lord. In all his 10,000 year existence, Ken had found no joy to touch the joy of battle, no lust greater than his lust for blood. Here on the field of mortal combat, he was more than in his element, he was at the site of his heart's desire. It was the thing that had caused him to betray his oath of allegiance to the emperor of mankind. His genetic destiny as a space marine and even his old comrades in the World Eaters Legion. He had never regretted those decisions even for an instant. The bliss of battle was reward enough to stay any doubts. He jumped the ditch before the parapet, ignoring the poisoned spikes which lined the pit bottom and promised an ecstatic death to any that fell upon them. He scrambled up the loose scree of the rock face and vaulted over the low wall, planting his boot firmly into the face of the defender as he did so. The man screamed and fell back trying to stem the flow of blood from his broken nose. Ken swung Gora child and ended his whining forever. Death is upon you Ken roared as he dived into a mass of depraved cultists. Gora child lashed out. Its teeth bit into hardened ceramite, spraying sparks in all directions. The blow passed through the target's armor, opening its victim from stomach to sternum. The wretch fell back, clutching at his ropey entrails. Kern dispatched him with a backhand swipe and fell upon his fellows, slaying left and right killing with every blow. Frantically, the cultist leader bellowed orders, but it was too late. Kern was in among them, and no man had ever been able to boast of facing Kern in close combat and living. The numbers 2243, then 2244, blinked before his eyes. The ancient gothic lettering of the digital death counter, superimposed on Kern's field of vision, incremented quickly. Kern was proud of this archaic device, presented by Warmaster Horus himself in ancient times. Its like could not be made in this degenerate age. Ken grinned proudly as his tally of offerings for this campaign continued to rise. He still had a long way to go to match his personal best but that was not going to stop him trying. Men screamed and howled as they died. Kern roared with pleasure. 
killing everything within his reach, reveling in the crunch of bone and the spray of blood. The rest of the Cornet force took advantage of the destruction the betrayer had caused. They swarmed over the walls in a howling mass and dismembered the Slanish worshippers. Already demoralized by the death of their leader, not even these fanatical worshippers of the Lord of Pleasure could stand their ground. Their morale broken, they panicked and fled. Such pathetic oaths were barely worth the killing. Ken decided, lashing out reflexively and killing those Slanish worshippers who passed too close as they fled. 2246 2247 2248 went the death counter. It was time to get on with his mission. It was time to find the thing he had come here to destroy. The ancient demonic artifact known as the Heart of Desire. Attack Ken bellowed and charged through the gaping mouth of the leering stone head that was the entrance to the main temple building. Inside it was quiet, as if the roar of battle could not penetrate the walls. The air stank of strange perfumed. The walls had a porous, fleshy look. The pink tinged light was odd. It shimmered all around, coming from no discernible source. Kern switched to the auto sensor systems within his helm, just in case there was some trickery here. Leather clad priestesses, their faces domino masked, emerged from padded doorways. They lashed at Ken with whips that sent surges of pain and pleasure through his body. Another man, one less hardened than Ken, might have been overwhelmed by the sensation but Ken had spent millennia in the service of his god. And what passed through him now was but a pale shadow compared to the battle lust that mastered him. He chopped through the snake-like flesh of the living lash. Poison blood spurted forth. The woman screamed as if he had cut her. Looking closer he saw that she and the whip were one. A leering demonic had tipped the weapon's handle and had buried its fangs into her wrist. Ken's interest was sated. He killed the priestess with on backhanded swipe of Gora child. A strange, strangled cry of rage and hate warned him of a new threat. He turned and saw that one of the other berserkers, less spiritually pure than himself, had been overcome with the whip's evil. The man had torn off his helmet and his face was distorted by a sick and dreamy smile that had no place on the features of one chosen by Korn. Like a sleepwalker he advanced on Ken and lashed out with his chain sword. Ken laughed as he parried the blow and killed the man with his return stroke. A quick glance told him that all the priestesses were dead and that most of his followers had slain their drugged brethren. Good, thought Ken, but part of him was disappointed. He had hoped that more of his fellows would be overcome by treachery. It was good to measure himself against true warriors, not these decadent worshippers of an effete god. Gora child howled with frustrated bloodlust, writhing in his hand as if it would turn on him if he did not feed it more blood and sinew soon. Ken knew how the axe felt. He turned, gestured for his companions to follow him and raced off down the corridor. Follow me, he shouted, to the slaughter. Passing through a huge arch, the former space marines entered the inner sanctum of the temple and Ken knew they had found what they had come for. Light poured in through the stained glass ceiling. As he watched, Ken realized that the light was not coming through the glass, but from the glass itself. The illustrations glowed with an eerie internal light and they moved. A riotous assembly of men and women, mutants and demons enacted every foul deed that the depraved followers of a debauched god could imagine. And, Ken noted, they could imagine quite a lot. Kern raised his pistol and opened fire, but the glass merely absorbed the weapon's energy. Something like a faint moan of pleasure filled the chamber and mocking laughter drew Ken's attention to the throne which dominated the far end of the huge chamber. It was carved from a single gem that pulsed and changed color, going from amber to lavender to pink to lime and then back through a flickering, random assortment of iridescent colors that made no sense and hurt the eye. Ken knew without having to be told that this was the heart of desire. Senses honed by thousands of years of exposure to the stuff of chaos told him that the thing fairly radiated power. Inside was the trapped essence of a demon prince, held forever at the whim of Slanish's punishment for some ancient treachery. The man sitting so regally on the throne was merely a puppet and barely worth Ken's notice, save as something to be squashed like a bug. The man looked down on Ken as if they had the temerity to feel the same way about Korn's most devoted follower. His right hand held an obscenely shaped runa sword, which glowed with a blasphemous light. Ken strode forward to confront his new foe. The clatter of ceramite encased feet on marble told him that his fellow berserkers followed. In the matter of a hundred strides, Ken found himself at the foot of the dais, and some odd mystical force compelled him to stop and stare. Ken did not doubt that he was face to face with the cult leader. The man had the foul, debauched look of an ancient and immortal devotee of Slanesh. His face was pale and gaunt. Makeup concealed the dark shadows under his eyes. An obscene helmet covered the top of his head. As he stood, his pink and lime cloak billowed out behind him. 
tight bands of studded leather girded his naked chest, revealing lurid and disturbing tattoos. Welcome to the heart of desire, the Slanesh worshipper said in a soft, insinuating voice which somehow carried clearly across the chamber and compelled instant, respectful attention. Kern was instantly on his guard, sensing the magic within that voice, the persuasive power which could twist mortals to its owner's will. He struggled to keep the fury that burned eternally in his breast from subsiding under the influence of those slyly enthralling tones. What do you wish? Your death the betrayer roared, yet he felt his bloodless being subsided by that oddly comforting voice. The cult leader sighed. You worshippers of corn are so drearily predictable. Always the same tedious, unimaginative retort. I suppose it comes from following that monomaniacal deity of yours. Still you are hardly to be blamed for your god's dullness, I suppose when corn has devoured your soul, you will pay for such blasphemy Ken shouted. His followers shouted their approval but with less enthusiasm than Ken would have expected. For some reason, the man on the throne did not appear to be worried by the presence of so many armed men in his sanctum. Somehow, I doubt it. Old chapter. You see, my soul has long been pledged to thrice blessed Slanesh, so unless Korn wants to stick his talon down Slanesh's throat or some other orifice, he'll have a hard time getting at it. Enough of this prattle Cairn roared. Death is upon you. Oh, be sensible, the cultist said, raising his hand. Kern felt a tide of pleasure flow over him, like that he had felt from the whip earlier but a thousand times stronger. All around him he heard his men moan and gasp. Think. You can spend an eternity of pleasure being caressed by the power of Lord Slanesh, while your soul slowly rots and sinks into his comforting embrace. Anything you want, anything you have ever desired, can be yours. All you have to do is swear allegiance to Slanesh. Believe me, it's no trouble. As the cult leader spoke, image flickered through Cairn's mind. He saw visions of his youth and all the joys he had known, before the rebellion of Horus and the battle for terror. Somehow it had all looked so clear and fresh and appealing, and it almost brought moisture to his tear ducts. He saw endless banquets of food and wine. For a moment, his palate was stimulated by all manner of strange and wonderful tastes, and his brain tingled with a myriad pleasures and stimulations. Visions of diaphanously clad maidens danced before his eyes, beckoning enticingly. For a moment, despite himself, Cairn felt an almost unthinkable temptation to betray his ancient oath to the blood god. This was powerful sorcery indeed. He shook his head and bit his lip until the blood flowed. No true warrior of corn would fall for this pitiful trick he bellowed. Suddenly the rest of the berserkers were upon him. Ken found himself fighting for his immortal life. These were no mere slanish cultists. Newly tainted though they might be, they had once been worthy followers of corn. Fierce, deadly and full of bloodlust. Mighty maces bludgeoned Ken. Huge chain swords threatened to tear his rune encrusted armor. Bolter shells tore chunks from his breastplate. Kern fought on, undismayed, filled with the joy of battle, taking fierce pleasure every time Gora Child took another life. At last, these were worthy foes. The body count swiftly ticked to 2460 and continued to rise. Instinctively Kern sidestepped a blow that tore off one of the metal skulls which dangled from his belt. The betrayer swore he would replace it with the attacker's own skull. His return stroke made good his vow. He whirled Gora Child in a great figure of eight and cleared a space all around him, sending two more traitors to make their excuses to the blood good. Insane bloodlust surged through him, overcoming even the soporific influence of the Heart of Desire and for a moment Ken fought with his full unfettered power. He became transformed into an unstoppable engine of destruction and nothing could stand against him. Ken's heart pounded. The blood sang through his veins and the desire to kill made him howl uncontrollably. Bones crunched beneath his axe. His pistol blew away the life of its targets. He stamped on the heads of the fallen, crushing them to jelly. Ken ignored pain, ignored any idea of self-preservation, and fought for the pure love of fighting. He killed and he killed. All too soon it was over, and Ken stood alone in a circle of corpses. His breathing rasped from his chest. Blood seeped through a dozen small punctures in his armor. He felt like a rib might have been broken by the last blow of that mace but he was triumphant. His counter read 2485. He sensed the presence of one more victim and turned to confront the figure on the dais. The cultist's leader stood looking down on him with a faint expression of mingled disbelief and distaste on his face. The throne pulsed enticingly. It's true what they say, the man said with a delicious sigh. If you want anything done properly, you have to do it yourself. The insinuating voice drove Ken's fury from him and left him feeling tired and spent. The cultist strode down from the dais. Ken felt almost too weary to parry his blow. 
He knew he must throw off this enchantment quickly. The runous ward bit into his armor and a wave of mingled pain and pleasure passed through Ken like poison. Summoning his last reserves of rage, he threw himself into the attack. He would show this effete fop who was the true warrior here. Ken hacked. Gora child bit into the tattoos of the man's wrist. Gobbits of flesh and droplets of blood whirled away from the axe's teeth. The rank smell of hot bone filled the air as the hand separated from the arm and began to crawl away with a life of its own. Kern stamped on it and a rictus of pain appeared on its owner's face, as if the hand was still attached. Ken swung. The cultist head separated from its shoulders. The body swung its bleed, a puppet still controlled by the strings of its master's will. It bit into Ken and the wave of sensation almost drove him to his knees. Nice trick roared Ken, feeling the hand squirm beneath his boot, but I've seen it before. He brought his chain axe down on the head and clove it in two. The body fell to the ground, a puppet with its strings cut. 2486, Ken thought with some satisfaction. The betrayer advanced upon the throne. It pulsed enticingly before him. Within its multiple facets he thought he saw the face of a beautiful woman, the most beautiful he had ever seen, and the most evil. Her hair was long and golden, and her eyes were blue. Her lips were full and red and the small, white fangs that protruded from her mouth in no way marred her perfection. She looked at Ken beseechingly, and he knew at once he was face to face with the demon trapped within the heart of desire. Welcome, Ken, a seductive voice said within his head. I knew you would triumph. I knew you would be the conqueror. I knew you would be my new master. The voice was thrilling. By comparison, the cult leader's voice had been but a pale echo. But the voice was also deceptive. Proud as he was, mighty as he knew himself to be, Ken knew that no man could truly be the master of a demon. Not even a fallen space marine like himself. He knew that his soul was once more in peril, that he should do something. But yet again, he found himself enthralled by the persuasiveness of a slanish worshipper's voice. Be seated. Become the new ruler of this world. Then go forth and blast those meddlesome interlopers from the face of your planet. Kern fought to hold himself steady while the throne pulsed hypnotically before him, and the smell of heavy musk filled his nostrils. He knew that once he sat he would be trapped, just as the demon was trapped. He would become a slave to the thing imprisoned within the throne. His will would be drained and he would be a decadent and a feet shadow of the Ken he had once been. Yet his limbs began to move almost of their own accord, his feet slowly but surely carrying him towards the throne. Once more, visions of an eternity of corrupt pleasure danced in Ken's mind. Once more he saw himself indulging in every excess. The demon promised him every ecstasy imaginable and it was well within its power to grant such pleasures. He knew it would be a simple thing for him to triumph on its behalf. All he had to do was step outside and announce that he had destroyed the heart of desire. He was Ken, he would be believed, and after that it would be a simple matter to lure the corn worshippers to ecstatic service or joyful destruction. And did they not deserve it? Already he was known as the betrayer, when all he had done was be more loyal to his god than the spineless weaklings he had slaughtered. And with that the demon's voice fell silent and the vision stopped, as if the thing and the throne had realized its mistake, but too late. For Ken was loyal to corn and there was only room for that one thing within his savage heart. He had betrayed and killed his comrades in the world eaters because they had not remained true to Korn's ideals and would have fled from the field of battle without either conquering or being destroyed. The reminder gave him strength. He turned and looked back at the room. The reek of blood and dismembered bodies filled his nostrils like perfume. He remembered the joy of the combat. The thrill of overcoming his former comrades. He looked out on a room filled with corpses and a floor carpeted with blood. He was the only living thing here and he had made it so. He realized that, compared to this pleasure, this sense of conquest and victory, what the demon offered was only a pale shadow. Ken turned and brought Gora child smashing down upon the foul throne. His axe howled thirstily as it drank deep of the ancient and corrupt soul imprisoned within. Once more he felt the thrill of victory, and knew no regrets for rejecting the demon's offer. 2487. Not his personal best, but still a good day's work. So what do you guys make of this? Now, I don't normally do a lot of serious 40k stories, but like, you know, I really enjoyed this one and I've been really been feeling like, you know, the Chaos Space Moon vibes since the Darkly videos. And like, you know, I don't know, I just fucking love Karin the Betrayer. Like, he has to be my favourite first captain by far. Maybe, like, okay, Sigismund's in there as well, but like, you know, come on.
like, you know, he isn't a bit of a, he doesn't have a bit of a soft spot for the Black Templars, you know what I mean? Like, you know, I'm pretty sure, same as me, a lot of people started, like, you know, in third edition, like, you know, get that box set with the Dark Elder and the Black Templars, you know, come on here, like, you know, I'm pretty sure most people have a bit of a nostalgic memory of them anyway. And of course, you guys know, like, you know, I would align with Slaanesh for all you long-time viewers, like, you know, I think Slaanesh is one of the only things in 40k I've made more than, like, three or four videos on. Like, I fucking love Slaanesh. But, like, you know, it's it's Karn the Betrayer, though. Like, come on here, he's, like, the only sensible berserker ever. Like, you know, that, like, trust me, if you get the chance, after this, um, it's from the Black Library audiobook. Uh, it's called The Butcher's Nails. Fucking great. It's about Lugar and Anglon in Black in the Dark Crusade or in the well, during the heresy. And it's great. Honestly, if you enjoyed this, I would really, really recommend giving that audiobook a go because it was genuinely outstanding. Like I really would push you as much as I could to go check it out. But like, you know, like let us know what you thought. Like, you know, while I do more serious stories like this, I I really enjoyed it. I actually really got into it. And it's a nice bit of a change of pace. I might do some more serious ones instead of just silly fan fiction type of stuff like you know but like you know healthy mix of them both you know what i mean but hey look as i say let us know what you thought down below and be sure to like and subscribe for more if you haven't already check out my red bubble portfolio you might just find something you like this this is, is not okay this needs to stop now this is cancer this this is so much cancer that i can feel the tumors growing on my back and it's way down heavy on me, and it's not okay. Can you help a nigga out and just stop this, please?